Hello, friends. Imagine with me for a moment that we are traveling to the historic city of Constance in the very south of Germany, located on the western end of beautiful Lake Constance, just very adjacent to Switzerland. This university city, Constance, currently has approximately 83,000 inhabitants and was the seat of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Constance for more than 1,200 years. Today, if we walk just a short distance from the old city, we come into a fairly modern neighborhood with houses lining the paved street uh, and, and a park bench and several benches situated nicely on, a, on green grass. And walking down the street, our eye catches a small island of greenery in the middle of the road. Coming closer, we notice a massive rock on this small traffic island. Carved in gold lettering on one side of the rock, we see the name Johann Hus, that is Jan Hus or Hus. 6th of July, 1415. On the other side, we see another name. Hieronymus von Prague, that is Jerome of Prague, 30th of May, 1416. This memorial stone from blackish limestone was funded by donations and unveiled on October 6, 1862. In fact, I have to tell you, I have been there. I have seen it. I have been impressed personally by what happened there. You see, each year it is the site of an annual commemoration of John Hus, Jan Hus, and Jerome of Prague. Who were these two men, and why are they commemorated with black limestone? Hus and Jerome, like Wycliffe, were forerunners of the Reformation. Their work spread across Bohemia, a country now known as the Czech Republic, and beyond as they brought the saving truths found in Scripture to thousands across the European continent. Jan Hus was born on July 6, 1373, into a peasant home. His father passed away soon after Jan's birth, leaving his poor widow to raise their son alone. His mother was a God-fearing woman who helped instill faith in her son. She believed in education and encouraged her son to attend the University of Prague, where he received a full scholarship. Before leaving him at the university, she knelt down beside her son, praying that God would be with him and protect him from the trials that he would no doubt face. Little did she realize how her prayers would be answered. Huss was an outstanding scholar and soon earned the respect of all. After completing his studies, he entered the priesthood and was soon invited to join the court of the king. He was also made professor and later rector or leader of the University of Prague. Before long, Huss became the pride of Bohemia and was known and respected throughout Europe. Several years after becoming a priest, Huss was appointed preacher at the Bethlehem Chapel in Prague in 1402. The founder of this chapel placed great importance on services being held in the language of the people rather than in Latin. Conducting services in the Bohemian language had been a common practice, and the Bible was translated into that language very early. But when Gregory VII ascended the papal throne, he issued a bull forbidding public worship to be conducted in the Bohemian tongue. Nevertheless, in some places, services were still conducted in that native language. Jerome, who would later work closely with Huss, studied at Oxford University in England and returned to Bohemia with the writings of John Wycliffe. 
When he returned to Prague, Jerome met Huss, who had become familiar with the writings of Wycliffe and had become a strong proponent of God's Word. Together, these two men, Huss and Jerome, spread the teaching of Scripture across their native land and beyond. Now, Jerome was the more gifted orator, but Huss was a man of firm character, and Jerome looked up to him as a spiritual leader. A primary teaching of Huss and Jerome was that the precepts of Scripture conveyed through the understanding are to rule the conscience. In other words, that God speaking in the Bible and not the church speaking through the priesthood is the one infallible guide. Of course, this went directly against the teaching of the Catholic Church, and before long, these reformers felt the wrath of Rome. A general council was summoned to meet at Constance to address a number of issues the church was facing, including three rival popes in what became known as the Great Schism, as well as to root out potential heresy. John Huss, or Jan Hus, was summoned to appear before the council. Although he had been promised safe conduct, promised, soon after arriving in Constance, he was arrested and put in a damp dungeon cell. Hearing of the plight of Huss, Jerome set out for Constance. But once he arrived in the city, he realized there was nothing he could do to help his friend. Attempting to flee, he was soon arrested and also placed in a loathsome prison cell. Huss was at least brought before the council where he was asked to either recant his doctrines or suffer death. Although enfeebled by illness and imprisonment, Huss stood boldly for the truth and accepted the martyr's fate. When pressed to renounce his, quotes, errors, he asked, what errors shall I renounce? I know myself guilty of none. I call God to witness that all that I have written and preached has been the view of rescuing souls from sin and perdition, and therefore most joyfully will I confirm with my blood that truth which I have written and preached. He was condemned and taken to the stake in a place located just outside the city. When the flames kindled about him, he began to sing, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me, and so continued till his voice was silenced forever. After spending several excruciating months of torture in the dungeon, Jerome met the same fate as Huss and was burned in the same spot just outside the city where the black rock stands today in silent witness of these two martyrs, even as passengers and cars go by, people not even realizing what had happened there, even the enemies who witnessed the execution of these two men, were struck with their calm bearing. A strong supporter of the Pope described it this way, both bore themselves with constant mind when their last hour approached. They prepared for the fire as if they were going to a marriage feast. They uttered no cry of pain. When the flames rose, they began to sing hymns and scarce could the vehemency of the fire stop their singing. Friends, today we have just scratched the surface of the story of these two great godly men, men that personally I look up to and appreciate for their loyalty to God. I strongly encourage you read more about them in chapter 6 of the inspiring book, The Great Controversy. If you do not yet have a copy of this marvelous book, you can download your free copy at greatcontroversyproject.org today. As we consider the faithfulness of Huss and Jerome, 
and many others who have been martyred for Jesus. Let us remember the beautiful text of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray together just now. Father, thank you for inspiring these great reformers, us and Jerome, to not only stand for truth, but even to die for truth, and to die singing praises to you. Lord, help us to be as faithful as they were. Give us fortitude as we look to the future and challenges that we will face as people attempt in some way to dislodge our belief in the Holy Word of God and the Word alone, not human tradition, not humanism, not ideas of philosophy, but only the Word of God. Help us to be true and loyal to your Word, as Huss and Jerome and countless others were. Thank you for their example. Live within our hearts through the Holy Spirit and help us to stand for you and Bible truth. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.